Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for the very kind introduction. I am grateful for the opportunity to be here and give a short presentation on benefits of dietary fiber beyond digestion. Hopefully, you can learn more new things and something useful uh, in your respective field of practice. My presentation will proceed as follows. First is a short introduction on fiber, particularly its definition, types, and sources. Then I will give a short discussion on the alterations of dietary fiber on body organs, followed by overview of mechanisms of action. Next will be the beneficial health benefits of dietary fiber on obesity, GIT diseases, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, immunity, and brain health. Afterwards, I will give some guidelines on dietary fiber intake and some potential side effects to take note. Finally, some key takeaway before I end my presentation. Before I start, I would like us to have a quick sharing time. So please type in the chat box your favorite food which you think has a lot of fiber in it. Okay? So I will give you 15 seconds to share your answer with us. So we are getting various responses from the group, and I just want to thank you all for your participation. For now, keep those food items in mind, and hopefully as we proceed with the discussion, you get to appreciate more that favorite food of yours. Okay? So to start, it will be nice to begin with the definition of fiber. The term dietary fiber was coined by Dr. Eben Hipsley in 1953, and this was previously known as roughage. The American Association for Clinical Chemistry defined fiber as the edible part of plants or their extracts that are resistant to digestion and absorption in the human small intestine and undergoes uh, complete or partial fermentation in the large intestine. This was in agreement with the definition from the Codex Alimentarius Commission defining fiber as edible carbohydrate polymer with 10 or more monomeric units that are resistant to digestive enzyme. Now, in case you're wondering on what does fiber looks like, I have here a sample structure of dietary fiber in wheat and the sperm under a microscope. So fiber has two general types, which I believe most of you are already aware of. First is the soluble dietary fiber or SDF. This kind of fiber dissolves in water and turns into a gel-like substance that aids in the regulation of digestion and absorption in the GAT. Therefore, it can help address diarrhea. Soluble dietary fiber are fermentable, so it is usually associated with many health benefits including positive effects on mineral absorption, barrier function, fat metabolism, as well as glycemic and insulin responses. The second type is called insoluble dietary fiber or IDF which, as the name suggests, does not mix with water and typically remains intact or only partially fermented as it goes through the digestive system. This, in turn, serves as bulking agent and might increase stool volume and hasten the transit of food and waste through your GIT, thereby helpful in treating constipation. The subcategories or components of this fiber are presented in this figure. So soluble fiber is categorized into gums, beta-glucans, pectins, mucilages, and others. Whereas insoluble fiber is mainly divided into cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. However, please do take note that despite this classification, most fiber-rich foods contain both soluble and insoluble fibers in varying proportions. Some with more soluble and some with more insoluble fiber. Some common sources of dietary fiber according to types and categories can be seen in these figures. So we have oats, barley, beans, lentils, and fruits for soluble fiber, and whole wheat, whole grain, vegetables like kale and broccoli for insoluble fiber. Again, please remember that most fruits and vegetables 
contain a mixture of both types of fiber. It's important to be familiar with these types of fiber since uh, this can influence the potential functional benefits of fiber to various health outcomes. For us to discuss the mechanisms of action later, it would be best to have some common knowledge on the alterations that dietary fiber can do in the human body. So this figure summarizes this common alterations which also influence the potential mechanisms of dietary fiber for its beneficial effects against obesity and associated metabolic diseases. As you can see here, dietary fiber affects the gut-brain axis, which is the biochemical communication between the central and enteric nervous systems, linking emotional and cognitive centers of the brain with the peripheral intestinal functions. One effect of fiber in the gut-brain axis is that it can increase satiety hormones. In the mouth, fiber acts as a barrier for salivary enzymes and at the same time increases the need for more chewing time. In the stomach, fiber can increase the viscosity of gastric contents. These two reasons influence the meal size and caloric intake of an individual. For the gut microorganisms or microbiome, fiber promotes production of short-chain fatty acids which promote series of biological processes leading to various health benefits. In the GI tract and pancreas, fiber helps delay carbohydrate digestion. In the small intestine, fiber reduces cholesterol reab reabsorption. In the liver, fiber influences insulin secretions and metabolisms of cholesterol and estrogen. Finally, in small and large intestines, fiber can help reduce bile acids and potential carcinogens, leading to beneficial effects against cancer. With those alterations of dietary fiber in the body organs, Various mechanisms were investigated by numerous scientific studies and shown to be somewhat overlapping on how they can promote positive health outcomes. In particular, the effects of dietary fiber on prevention and management of diseases are highly related with the increased production of short-chain fatty acids or SCFAs. So therefore, it will be best to give an overview of this mechanism. In this figure, you can see that the dietary fiber is fermented by the gut microbiota in the large intestine producing SCFAs. These SCFAs promote the increase in hormones PYY and GLP-1, insulin sensitivity, cancer cell death, and intestinal integrity, which are all conducive to prevent and improve the occurrence of obesity, diabetes, cancer, and intestinal diseases. In the succeeding slides, I will be discussing the wonders of fiber beyond digestion and how dietary fiber exhibits its health-promoting properties based on available scientific evidence. So first, let's talk about dietary fiber and obesity. To date, there are numerous interventional animal and human studies supporting the beneficial effects of dietary fiber against obesity since the late 1960s and early 19. 70s. It was seen that it generally aids in weight management by lowering overall caloric intake. There are two terms important in this part and these are satiety and satiation. Satiety refers to the feeling of fullness between meals whereas satiation refers to the feeling of fullness during ingestion of a meal acting as a terminating factor. So the potential mechanisms of action for this observed effect include first, as I mentioned earlier, high fiber foods require more chewing activity in terms of effort and time. This effect may promote satiation by reducing the rate of ingestion. Moreover, increased volume of saliva and gastric acid produced over mastication may further increase stomach distension procured by viscosity or gel formation. The nature of high fiber food is also a factor since most high fiber foods are generally lower in calorie content. Fiber, particularly soluble dietary fiber, can increase gelation and viscosity of gastric content which triggers stomach distension and signals of fullness. Moreover, this increase in gelation and viscosity of the gastric content also delays the gastric emptying and consequent slower nutrient absorption. 
This prolongation of the period during which nutrients are absorbed may reduce the hunger and increase satiety. Fibers can also entrap the nutrients, thereby physically impeding its digestion and absorption. Finally, intake of dietary fiber can also improve gut microbiota and production of short-chain fatty acids or SCFAs, promoting the secretion of gut hormones like glucagon like peptide 1 or GLP and peptide YY or PYY, which in turn promotes satiety. Next will be about gastrointestinal disorders, particularly IBS or irritable bowel syndrome and IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. Just to differentiate when we say irritable bowel syndrome, this is a condition in which contents move too fast or too slow through the intestines, usually accompanied by abdominal pain. Whereas inflammatory bowel disease includes two conditions that cause swelling and irritation in the digestive tract, in particular Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. According to literature, dietary fiber can help manage IBS or irritable bowel uh, syndrome via the following mechanisms. First is that dietary fiber has laxative effects wherein insoluble fiber helps increase fecal volume and accelerates colonic transit, which is beneficial for constipation, while soluble fiber can normalize stool form, which is beneficial for diarrhea. The increase in short-chain fatty acids produced by fermentation of soluble fiber appears to affect several intestinal hormones that stimulate absorption of water and electrolytes, improving gastrointestinal transit. In the case of inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, dietary fiber tends to decrease pro-inflammatory markers like interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha and increase anti-inflammatory marker like interleukin-10 which minimize inflammation and maintain normal tissue homeostasis. Soluble fiber can also promote uh, growth of beneficial gut bacteria and reduce number of pathogenic bacteria. This restores healthy gut microbiome and mitigates dysbiosis, which is the disturbance in the gut microbiota resulting in loss of intestinal homeostasis and inappropriate immune activation. The healthy gut microbiome can also improve the intestinal barrier that can protect the host from heightened immunological responses and persistent inflammation. Finally, intake of soluble fiber can increase the production of short-chain fatty acids and these uh, short-chain fatty acids can promote stronger intestinal mucus structure by improving mucus synthesis and secretion and uh, this intestinal mucus covers and protects the gut epithelium against infection and inflammation. Next disease is the influence of dietary fiber on diabetes mellitus. Various studies as early as 1970s found that dietary fiber has an important role in the prevention and management of diabetes. However, most evidence came from rather short-term trials and have significant between study variations. Therefore, further long-term and high-quality randomized control trials are needed. Nevertheless, the existing uh, literature revealed that dietary fiber significantly reduced HbA1c or glycated hemoglobin, fasting blood glucose, fasting insulin, and homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance or HOMA-IR which provides insulin resistance score. The potential mechanisms uh, for these beneficial effects include, first is that the weight loss promoting effect of fiber, as I discussed earlier, can also affect the satiety and satiation resulting in overall lower caloric intake. Fibrous uh, particles also act as a physical barrier to glucose molecules delaying its diffusion and absorption. The high viscosity of soluble fibers also lead to delayed digestion and absorption of glucose, which improves the incretins like GLP-1 and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide or GIP, 
which are hormones responsible in regulating the amount of insulin to be secreted after eating. This in turn decreases insulin secretion response and hepatic glucose release, thus providing significant reduction on blood glucose. On top of those mechanisms, the improvement in gut microbiota brought about by the intake of soluble fiber uh, wherein uh, there is an increase in the lactobacilli and bifidobacteria family could reduce several inflammatory markers like uh, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, C-reactive proteins, and lipopolysaccharides, which can inhibit proper insulin signaling. So the lower inflammatory markers could help lessen insulin resistance and therefore reduction in blood glucose levels. Dietary fiber, particularly inulin, was also shown to increase short chain fatty acids production in favor of propionate. This can lower the gluconeogenesis and increase glycolysis, leading to lower glucose levels. On the other hand, insoluble dietary fiber does not directly influence postprandial glucose or insulin sensitivity. The major beneficial effects of insoluble fibers are mainly associated with the presence of bioactive compounds such as phenolic compounds with antioxidants, which have been demonstrated to improve glucose metabolism, insulin signaling, insulin secretion, and decrease insulin resistance and inflammatory markers. Moving on, the effects of dietary fiber on cardiovascular diseases and its biomarkers uh, are also well-studied area of research with increasing body of evidence over the recent years. However, just like with the other literature, there are some inconsistencies of results uh, depending on various factors including the amount, type, and source of fiber, ju the duration of the study, and the reference population. However, in general, dietary fiber intake yielded risk reduction for cardiovascular diseases like coronary heart disease and total mortality. The reported mechanisms of actions are the following. First, the weight loss promoting effect of fiber is also beneficial in controlling cardiovascular diseases and its biomarkers since we all know that obesity is a major risk factor for these diseases. Next, the lower glucose and insulin secretion brought about by the delay in gastric emptying is also associated with lower HMG-CoA or the rate-limiting enzyme in cholesterol biosynthesis which ultimately leads to lower hepatic cholesterol production and blood lipid concentrations. Also, the beneficial effects of fiber on weight gain, insulin resistance, and endothelium-mediated vasodilation associated with lower blood cholesterol uh, can all reduce the risk and severity of hypertension. As you may know, the major pathway of hepatic cholesterol catabolism in the body is via bile acid synthesis. Since these bile acids are synthesized from cholesterol and are important aspects of lipid digestion. Soluble fiber has bile acid binding capacity, which can increase bile acid excretion in the stools and lower its reabsorption. This leads to higher or activation of the hepatic de novo bile acid synthesis, which make the liver increase the catabolism of cholesterol by LDL receptor upregulation to replenish the bile acid pool, leading to lower serum cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Another mechanism is through the improved gut microbiome and production of short-chain fatty acids, particularly propionate, which may contribute to inhibition of HMG-CoA, which is uh, a rate-limiting rate enzyme in cholesterol biosynthesis. On the other hand, dietary fiber can also improve specific species of the gut microbiota that can lead to the formation of uh, trimethylamine or TMA and therefore decrease in the uh, hepatic conversion to trimethyl oxide or TMAO which is a risk factor to development of atherosclerosis. In addition to dietary fiber, the presence 
of other bioactive compounds in fruits and vegetables such as phytosterols, saponins, polyphenols, uh, antioxidants, and others can contribute to prevention and management of cardiovascular diseases. For cancer, several uh, studies have identified an inverse relationship between some forms of cancer and high-fiber diet, but this is still a very active area of research. Moreover, cancer is a multifactorial disease in, in nature. Therefore, it is not surprising that some studies uh, found no significant benefits. However, the occurrence of cancer is closely related to eating habits and it was shown that high-fiber diet can effectively prevent the occurrence of some forms of cancer including colorectal, ovarian, and breast cancer. Uh, insoluble fiber like lignin has been shown to protect against colorectal cancer by directly absorbing potential carcinogens within the GIT. It can also increase uh, stool volume that dilutes potential carcinogen and decrease transit time. So this dilution and decrease in transit time would reduce the likelihood of carcinogens coming into contact with the gut, mucosa, and epithelial cells, therefore reducing the chance of carcinogens being absorbed and causing damage to the cells. Furthermore, uh, the proposed mechanism for the prevention of breast cancer by dietary fiber involved estrogen metabolism. This is because high levels of estrogen have been linked to development of tumor within breast tissues. Fortunately, there were evidence showing that high fiber intake was found to reduce estrogen synthesis and absorption in the colon and increase fecal estrogen excretion uh, thereby reducing concentration of estrogen levels. Again, SCFAs from the gut microbiota have a role to play in cancer inhibition. SCFAs such as butyrate decrease pH in the colon and inhibit histone deacetylase or HDACs, which regulates the activity of numerous proteins involved in cancer progression. Therefore, uh, SCFAs promote anti-inflammatory activity, inhibit pathogenic bacteria, and promote anti-proliferation and cancer cell death. There is also a decrease in protein expression of uh, lipogenesis key factors, which in turn depletes the metabolic needs of cancer cells, leading to cell death. The increase in bile acid excretion I mentioned earlier can also help reduce the amounts of carcinogens in the GIT since these bile acids at high concentrations can promote the growth and proliferation of cancer cells. Moreover, insulin has been shown to be a growth factor that can stimulate abnormal cell growth. Therefore, the antihyperglycemic effects of fiber have also been related to a decrease in risk of some forms of cancer. Finally, uh, dietary fibers, especially insoluble fibers, may also be complexed with antioxidants and phytochemicals, which may be released in the colon due to fermentation. And this can create a GIT environment for the prevention of diseases such as cancer. In terms of immunity, there is a significant potential for the use of dietary fiber in promoting immune health and scientific studies focusing on this research area are increasingly documented. One of the potential mechanisms of action is that the capacity of fiber to enhance the uh, mucosal barrier thickness which may prevent bacteria and viruses from degrading this important barrier and infecting the host. The healthy gut microbiome, particularly an increase in health-associated bacteria such as uh, bifidobacteria and lactobacilli and a decrease in health-detrimental pathogens like Clostridium, has been associated with lower systemic inflammation. Uh, Short-chain fatty acids can also activate the anti-inflammatory signaling cascades to G-protein-coupled receptors 
and this can lower inflammatory markers and the NFKB activity which plays a key role in regulating the immune response to infection. Increase in dietary fiber intakes were also associated with increased level of macrophages, reduced in pro-inflammatory factor called CXCL1, and increased CD8 positive T cells, which are important for killing cancerous and virally infected cells and in protecting against secondary infections. There are also studies reporting that the improved uh, gut microbiota could contribute to blocking of cell endocytosis, destabilizing virion morphology, and suppressing viral replication. Lastly, the studies about the importance of fiber in cognitive functions are less explored. Emerging evidence from animal studies uh, using synthetic extracted or single foods high in fiber shed light on the critical involvement of fiber in brain health. But data from human cohorts are scarce, with only a handful of observational and interventional studies being available. Moreover, these uh, studies used normal healthy population and some even showed no significant effects on cognitive performance. While the knowledge on the association between dietary fiber and cognition is growing, uh, recent evidence are also introducing that adequate dietary fiber may be an important factor in supporting mental well-being by lowering odds of developing depression. In terms of cognitive function, the importance of diet quality across the lifespan has been also acknowledged. Some of the observational studies and their relevant results were as follow. In children, higher intakes of dietary fiber were associated with increased cognitive control involving attentional inhibition. In another study among children, higher scores in verbal reasoning were associated with high intakes of fiber. Among adults, intake of high fiber was linked with higher cognitive performance in verbal learning psychomotor speed, sustained attention, and working memory. Lastly, in elderly, high intakes of dietary fiber were associated with better brain integrity in terms of larger total brain volume and less white matter damage. This was associated with higher cognitive capacity, lower cognitive decline, and lower errors on mental status questionnaires among older adults. For interventional studies, intake of fiber through mixed screens resulted in improvements in mental fatigue tests among adolescents. In adults, intake of BGOS or B-muno-galacto-oligosaccharides resulted in increased executive functioning, accuracy in recognition memory, and recall task. In case of polydextrose, higher cognitive flexibility and sustained attention was reported among adults. Finally, among adult to elderly population, increased intake of fiber via very beverage yielded increased performance in working memory test. The mechanisms underlying the benefits of fiber on cognition have not been established but there are some candidate mechanisms for its impacts wherein several microbiota-dependent pathways were proposed. First is that certain microbes can degrade dietary fiber, supporting their growth and the production of short-chain fatty acids. These microbes themselves and the uh, short-chain fatty acids can regulate neurochemistry relevant to cognitive processing. This can also stimulate neurotransmitter production uh, and influence neuronal function. Likewise, gut hormones like ghrelin and peptide YY with neuroactive potentials can be affected by microbes and microbial metabolites. Another important pathway whereby dietary fiber exerts influence on cognition could be immune-mediated through the kynurenine pathway or the vagus nerve, which can control specific body functions including digestion and immune system. All these mechanisms are associated with improved cognition 
particularly on memory, speed processing, cognitive flexibility, working memory, and attention. With all the beneficial effects of dietary fiber in various diseases, let's now have another sharing time. Uh, I have a quick question here and please type in your answer in the chat box. So there's no right or wrong answer for this one, so I hope you can share your answer with us. So what is or are your ways of increasing dietary fiber in your diet? A, by eating more plant-based food. B, by reducing intake of animal-based foods. C, by following pinggang Pinoy. D, by reading food labels. E, all of the above. Or if you have uh, another answer, you may type it or specify it in our chat box. So again, I'll give you 15 seconds to answer. Okay, so thank you so much for your responses and hopefully most of us have at least one way of increasing our dietary intake of fiber. In relation to my quick question, I will be sharing some recommended guidelines on dietary fiber intake. According to the Philippine Dietary Reference Intakes, the recommended dietary fiber intake among average healthy Filipino adults is between 20 to 25 grams per day. And some strategies to achieve this uh, amount is by buying and prioritizing fresh, whole foods over processed, refined counterparts. Second is to consume more plant-based foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, seeds, and nuts. It would also be good to just consume the recommended amounts of animal protein per day to give more space for plant-based foods. We can also follow the Pinggang Pinoy by the Food and Nutrition Research Institute, which recommends that one half of our plate, each meal, should comprise of fruits and vegetables. Snacking on whole plant-based foods is also a good way to add more fiber in our diet. If possible, consume fruits and vegetables unpeeled since these uh, this peels also contain various vitamins, minerals, and of course, fiber. We can also plan our meals and adapt high-fiber recipes for easier adoption and better sustainability. Finally, reading the food labels is also a great way to compare and choose nutrient-dense manufactured foods. So a good source of fiber has 10% of the recommended amount or around 2 to 2.5 grams per serving. And an excellent source of fiber contains 20% of the recommended amount which translates to approximately 4 to 5 grams of fiber per serving. For the last part of my content, I will be sharing some potential reported side effects of consuming high-fiber diets. First is that there is poor tolerance and acceptability due to difficulties encountered with chewing fiber-rich foods, no? especially among elderly. There's also a concern raised based on some studies using large doses of dietary fiber wherein it could reduce the absorption of some trace elements like iron, zinc, magnesium, calcium, and so on, particularly in those with marginal intakes of minerals. But good news is mineral deficiency due to high fiber diets is rarely an issue because natural fiber rich foods tend to be Excellent sources also of vitamins, minerals, and bioactive compounds. There are also individuals who are not used or sensitive to a high-fiber diet, and they tend to develop some gastrointestinal side effects like abdominal distension, platulence, bloating, diffuse abdominal pain, and diarrhea. But all these are certainly tolerable in exchange for the many benefits derived from higher intakes of dietary fiber. One strategy to improve tolerance is by introducing the fiber initially in small amounts and progressively increased over time. For my key takeaway, I hope you appreciate fiber as 
a cost-effective intervention. But please be aware that the information I discussed here were mostly areas of active research when it comes to fiber and health outcomes, which provides us of many research areas to explore on dietary fiber. Besides, uh, response to dietary fiber in certain diseases is variable due to prevalence of inter-individual variations in metabolism and gut microbiota. These variations have been related to varying effects of dietary fiber on host metabolic phenotypes, suggesting that a one-size-fits-all fiber supplementation strategy to improve health is unlikely to generate consistent outcomes across individuals. Therefore, these are not really recommendations but rather additional knowledge which could be helpful in our respective field of practice, such as in doing nutrition education activities no? to encourage the adoption of high-fiber foods at the individual, household, local, and even national levels. So basically, that concludes my presentation. Hopefully, you learned something today that makes you appreciate more your favorite fiber-rich food. Thank you very much for your participation and good afternoon.